BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello, I'm Gemma Kearney and you're listening to Don't You Forget About Me from BBC Radio 4. Incredible music documentaries that you'll want to hear again. Time to fill your ears with something wonderful. It is a joy to bring you this almost forgotten gem from the archives. Where does house club culture come from? That moment, right, late 70s, the opening of the warehouse and the music box. Thousands of teenagers migrating into this new spot. I would see neon makeup, and I would see like layers of beads, and I would see them wearing camisoles with combat boots, and I was like, what kind of dress is this? For the people of Chicago, house music is a religion whose congregation gather together to share stories and memories. There were no tables, there were no chairs. It was just one big room. You party there from midnight until noon the next day. I'm surprised to see your suitcase at the door. But most of those venues are gone. Don't you want some more? Deuces is gone, warehouse is gone, music box gone. The spot, Garmy, not even there. Oh, if we all had to DJ in America, we'd starve to death. But today, in the city where house music was created, those memories are fading, and many of its best DJs need to leave to fly to Europe to earn a living. I think a lot of people would be thrilled if you could pay the rent and not have to fly nine hours to work. I hope that day comes. Histories can be confusing, and this really is no different. But few people argue about the role played by a native New Yorker called Robert Williams. He moved to Chicago and opened a club that served no alcohol, just juice, slightly enhanced, where people danced all night. The club on 206 South Jefferson Street was called The Warehouse. Well, The Warehouse was like a redevelopment of Woodstock under a roof. <laughs> It was wild. To open his new club, Robert Williams persuaded another New Yorker, Frankie Knuckles, to come and play. And the style he developed created drama and momentum that really drove the packed dance floors to dance all night long. It all came from me basically just trying to keep my dance floor interested in coming to that club every week after disco was declared dead. Jimmy Pearsall back in the ballpark, and I'm sure glad, and I hope they don't let you people see what's going on here at Comiskey Park. One of the saddest sights I've ever seen in a ballpark in my life. This garbage of demolishing a record has turned into a fiasco. In 1979, a DJ called Steve Dahl encouraged 50,000 people to Chicago's Comiskey Park Baseball Stadium. Well, listen, we took all the disco records that you brought tonight, and we're going to blow them up real good. With its roots in the gay scene, the subtext was that disco betrayed rock and roll and authentic American values. Disco sucks! This Some 100,000 disco records were blown up. Disco sucks! Disco sucks! But from this debris came a grittier underground sound. The beginnings of house music. Robert Williams. In the early stages of house music, it was basically disco R&B, but it was taken underground. It was manipulated by the DJs like Mr. Knuckles. I did it out of necessity, you know what I mean? Because there were no more disco records being made, nothing with any kind of real energy. So at the club called The Warehouse, DJ Frankie Knuckles created his own sounds by reworking Philadelphia classics and soulful grooves, mixed up with a bit of European disco. He would re-edit records on a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, splicing the bits he liked best and creating a longer version that would keep the dance floor interested. 
Could you imagine getting a song that's like three and a half, four minutes long, and everybody's like, wow, it's really, really long. Yeah. You know, it's only like three and a half, four minutes, you know, compared yeah. to today. You had to really be on your job. If I hadn't brought him here, or he hadn't joined me here, I can't even expound on how the scene would be, or if there would have been a such thing as house music. As the warehouse crowds grew, Williams decided to double the entrance fee. Frankie Knuckles left to set up his own club, and in return, Robert Williams opened another club that would have a huge impact, called the Music Box. I decided I wasn't going to make the Music Box a gay club. The gay kids were looking at the straight kids over here, and they were like, oh, let's cross lines here. Hi, let me tell you something. Then Williams hired another key player in his story, a Californian DJ called Ron Hardy. Because Ron was, he had a radical style, okay, <laughs> if I can say that. So now Ron Hardy and Frankie Knuckles were competing for the club's attention. Different styles, different inspirations, but the same city. Producer and DJ, Marshall Jefferson. Ron Hardy at the music box would play until like, like eight and nine in the evening. Sometimes he'd do like three day parties, you know, just straight playing, you know, till he collapsed. Well, Ron was more rebelish in his delivery and style. That's what created a difference in house music. This is Producer Chip E. He was partying in the DJ booth. You know, a lot of DJs, what they see it as going to work. He saw it as, I'm going to a party and I just happen to be the guy who's gonna be playing the music. So he was there, he was dancing in the booth, he's drinking in the booth, he's doing other stuff in the booth. Unfortunately, due to his chemical addiction, he was doing heroin. So when he played, the music sounded slow to him. So he speeded it up. Robert Williams again. He was just the Billy Holiday of house music. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, each generation changed house music a little. House pioneer and producer, DJ Pierre. It was amazing. I seen people dancing, shouting, screaming Ron's name, and immediately I understood. It was like I was baptized into what house music was really all about. In 1981, a radio station in Chicago called WBMX brought house music to the masses. A group of DJs called the Hot Mix Five would broadcast for five hours every weekend. Rocky Jones, founder of the influential Chicago house label, DJ International. The real source of the house music, what house music really means, came off of what was called mixtape music. But the big thing that really changed everything was when WBMX Radio came on. A fellow named Lee Michaels here put together a group called the Hot Mix Five. When they did their mixes every Friday and Saturday night, people would rush home to record and listen to those mixes. The DJs really needed more music to play, and Chicagoans started to make their own tunes. This was at the time of new technology, enabling people to make records at home for the very first time. It all started with Jesse Saunders. <laughs> Jesse Saunders created a track called On and On, <laughs> which many consider to be the first house record. Marshall Jefferson. It was a DJ that everybody in Chicago knew. And it was like, everybody said, well, I can do better than that. These things inside my soul, they make me lose control. On and on. 
Marshall Jefferson grew up listening to rock and roll. He actually went to see the DJ Ron Hardy play because of a girl that he fancied and wanted to impress. He ended up falling in love with the music instead and began making his own house music. The first track I had played at a club was I've Lost Control. It went over big. That gave me confidence to continue. On the dance floor, if you're really into it, people would say you're jacking. Chip E also started making music. A lot of times people, you know, grab somebody on the back or the waist and they're just moving them in a fashion that's best described as jacking their body. We had all this European music and music that would play in gay clubs, you know, like the gangsters wouldn't listen to, you know. So you say house party and gangsters, oh, I ain't going there. You know, that's that gay music, that's that old, that old house music, I ain't going there. That's how house music got popular in Chicago. It was a safe party. You'd have 5,000 kids in a place and no violence, you know, because no gangsters would show up. By the end of 1985, there were two main house record labels in Chicago. Trax Records, run by Larry Sherman, and DJ International, founded by Rocky Jones. In those days, copying and bootlegging was really the norm, so only a few people actually made any money out of their efforts. Now, if you wanted to get your record pressed, you had to go through Sherman. DJ International's Rocky Jones. The first order that we made with that plant, I think it was 2,000 records. The guy who owned the plant said, you can't order that many records, you're not going to sell that many records. I think that weekend, it, the record sold out. I went back and I made a deal with him. I said, you know, what? I've got a 1975 convertible Corvette show car. I'll give you this car for vinyl. They thought I was crazy for it. And I probably may have been, so that's how that started. Pete Tong was working at London Records. He brought us in there. We made the first house album for them, and they brought it to the world in such a grand slam way. However it got its name, it's one of the hottest things going, and as Jay Levine reports, it may only be a matter of time before house musicians become heroes in their own home. <laughs> They started playing house music at this Michigan Avenue hotel and health club last summer, and they've been packing them in ever since. But in London, house has made it to the top of the pops faster than anything since the Beatles. All right, listen, we've got a new number one. You tell them about it. Steve Silk Hurley. An interesting thing about house music, from my own experience, is that I didn't hear it first in a club. I heard it on the radio and on top of the pops, astonishingly, when Farley Jackmaster Funk had his big hit record. What were you trying to do when you start? Make some money. Neil Tennant from the Pet Shop Boys. We went to Chicago in early 1988 when what have i done to deserve this is a big hit in america and the urban representative of emi in chicago was dispatched to sort of look after us and we said we want to hear house music and she'd never heard of it no. and as far as she was concerned the clubs you wanted to go to were just sleazy she said oh you want to go somewhere really sleazy Jack Your Body went to number one in the UK charts. So the British music press jumped on planes and headed to Chicago to try and discover the source of this underground sound. Meanwhile, Marshall Jefferson had just finished his track, Move Your Body, the house music anthem. I was there. Frankie Knuckles was there, Steve Silk Hurley was still there, Farley was there, and, you know, we all took over. 
Larry Sherman was dead set on not putting out Move Your Body. And the only reason he put it out is because he took some reporters around to like five different clubs and all of the clubs played Move Your Body on cassette. Move Your Body was pressed up on vinyl the very next day on Tracks Records, not my label. That's how big it was in those clubs. He wouldn't even put it out on my label. He put it out on his label. why he didn't press it up and he said that's not house music so that's where I called it the house music because <laughs> I knew how huge it was in all the clubs now up until this point 03 changed the sound of Chicago house music another producer called Pierre along with his friends Earl Smith and Nathaniel Jones formed a group called future when we first heard it just being used as how it was meant to be used as a bass guitar, it sounded good to us. So we bought one, we picked it up, and when we got it home, I did my norm. Normally I just grab the piece of gear and I start twisting knobs, see what it does. And when I did that on this 303, it sounded really crazy and different and unlike anything we ever heard before. And our goal as the group Future was to make something different. So once we heard that, we was like, yo, that's it, that's the sound. Acid tracks came out, and the next time I came to the UK, people were wearing like smiley t-shirts, go, I see it, you know. <laughs> Rave culture grew, smiley t-shirts became the latest fashion accessory, and the tabloid press was soon in uproar trying to shut the whole scene down. One of the first major UK clubs to embrace house music was Manchester's Hacienda, where Mike Prickering was DJing. The Friday night that I had at the Hacienda really lent itself to it. There was quite a few old Northern soul boys. They seemed to take to it immediately. So it probably connected better there, because I know in London, you know, when those records were first mm. being dropped, you know, it, you know, it kind of split the uh, dance floor. Oh, yeah, there was, there was I, a backlash I, I had some really bad gigs down here. Well, I, I thought they were quite good being an awkward Mancunian, but I played um, Fever at the Astoria, and I got booed that day. And six, seven months later, I played the trip at the same theatre. I've been watching you for so very long. People are going crazy to the same record. What is going on? What is going on? You stay out late at night and tell me you with your friends. But I know your friends are really just one man, but that's okay. That's okay. And that's alright. Right. Cause I'm leaving and I won't be back tonight. You trick me. I, think I don't think I've ever had a better period in my life than, than that. Chris Lowe from the Pet Shop Boys. Everyone was incredibly happy, and um, but uh, you know, for whatever reason, for whatever reason. So I remember being at one in this aircraft hangar, and as the sun came up, they opened the doors at the end of the aircraft hangar, and the sun was coming up over the fields, and everyone just, oh, it was just fantastic, magical. music was having a massive impact in Britain and across Europe. But in Chicago, it was in decline. By the late 90s, most of these venues start to close or people start to move back south. For the house music lovers of Chicago, like Abra Johnson, house music as they knew it changed. Um, lots of DJs start to migrate out and literally just age out, right? And at the same time, you see stricter curfew laws, venues uh, closing up. Really, I mean, you see this pinnacle in like 90, 91, right? And then the death of Ron Hardy. I think a really collective traumatic experience is I remember people grieved collectively and there was this huge procession down Halsted Street when he died. 
it really seemed like everything just closed up. We're constantly driving around trying to find any place that played house music, and it was really hard to find. Along with a collective of other house music fans, Abra's been collecting stories and memories of those clubs in Chicago. So parties start to move back into the South Side and way back into the South Side. And in part, you have an aging crowd, <laughs> but still love music and they're living out here in the burbs. But by the mid 90s, hip hop is huge. And many of us grow up. I remember the last night at Shelter. I remember the last night at Medusa's. Lots of people remember the last night at the warehouse. These are not just stories. In many ways, they're traumatic events. The way that we still talk about them like they happened yesterday. For Frankie Knuckles' best friend and manager, Frederick Dunstan, there's another reason why house music faltered in the early 90s. The record industry bastardized house music and attached a stigma of homophobia to it. And thereby the A&R directors wouldn't go out and promote it like they should have, the promoters wouldn't do it. And then finally they realized at one point, oh, we do have something here. But at that point, hip hop and rap had reared its head. And so who cares about the stepchild over there? The kids here that dropped the ball, house music, became stagnant. Thirty years on, the stepchild of house music called EDM, or electronic dance music, has become a multi-billion pound industry. This commercial sound has topped the charts and conquered America as DJs play to thousands of fist-pumping people. But why has it taken so long for dance music to make it in America? I think the reason they didn't get it in the first place was because it was a predominantly black and gay thing. DJ Mike Pickering again. Kids in the Midwest or, you know, in the malls were just into different kinds of music. Why they're into this now, I don't know. From my experience of it so far, it's not very musical because the music's pretty awful, to be honest. We don't realise where this music's come from where the cultures come from, that they had a culture in Chicago and in the warehouses, they have no idea. So this is Smart Bar, and um, here's the famous Smart Bar sound system. In it's Chicago, a... DJ Maria Stamper shows us around the Smart Bar where she's creative director. You can't really compare what has happened or hasn't happened in Chicago house music to what's going on in the world of EDM. It's more about the phone, It's really, more it? about the phone. <laughs> And they are pretty amazing. I mean, these shows, we have to say, that's what rock groups would have had years ago, and now they're building it sure. around a DJ, so it's a show. I'm sure that it was really awesome to see Kiss in the 70s, but I am totally uninterested in it. People get lost in the detail of who made the first house record. The more important part is where does house culture come from? And to me, you can't get away from Frankie when you ask that question. Smart Bar opened in 1982 and it continues to be one of the only places left that still plays true Chicago house. Its first guest was Frankie Knuckles. Were you aware when he was playing here, I mean we're in this club as you say which he DJed up for many many years, were you aware that he was kind of probably more famous in the uh, in the UK and Europe than he was across America. I mean, Everybody's more famous in the UK and Europe than they are in America. I mean, that's the great story of American dance artists. Everybody has to leave to be able to come home. As far as, you know, whether anybody's gotten their just rewards, I mean, you could pile money on these people and it would never be enough for what they've done for us. In April of 2014, Frankie Knuckles died unexpectedly. It led to a massive outpouring of grief. He was many things to many people. And even President Obama paid tribute to him. His longtime business partner and friend, Frederick Dunstan. 
to me, he will always be who he was to me. But after that person's gone, then you appreciate who they were and what they represented. Yeah, and uh, the fact that he was acknowledged by President Obama as well. He played for Oprah's Legends Ball, and the president did the proclamation. And the president and his wife just happens to walk around, and he goes, oh, I think I know who you are. And so they got a chance to talk. Just as Frankie Knuckles reinterpreted other people's music to create his own sounds, a new generation of mainly British DJs have picked up the mantle. The last two years have seen a new style of house music dominating UK nightlife and even the pop charts. Driven by acts like Disclosure, two 20-something brothers from South London. The first song on our new album is called Nocturnal, featuring The Weeknd. Opens with this big da -da 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 synth, which is completely based upon that song. We started writing that song about a week after Frankie Knuckles passed away, and we thought, what better way to like have a little tribute to him? He was also one of the first people to make a crossover house hit. He put vocals on house music, which you know not a lot of people do even yeah. today. Yeah. The ability to take on new machines and create like a new genre of music. Sometimes I feel I throw my hands up in the air. But I know I can count on you. Sometimes I feel like House music itself, there are, are places in this country that are amazing. America, when it's good, cannot be touched. Having said that, it's having the number of places that you need to do it for a living. I think a lot of people would be thrilled if you could pay the rent and not have to fly nine hours to work. I hope that day comes. For more amazing shows like this, then search for Don't You Forget About Me in BBC South.